on field. Uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm. The emergency this session runs till uh, let's get it right half past twelve. Um, we are already a few seconds or a few minutes even late. Um, what more relevant session after one of the more difficult summers um, for yeah. ruminants uh, and livestock systems? Um, we have three speakers this morning um, who are going to open up the, the discussion around, around uh, self-sufficiency and improving uh, forage provision um, for ourselves under uh, challenging circumstances and looking forward to going uh, towards uh, climate change and more unpredictable uh, weather. Um, so Ian's going to kick us off um, looking at what he's doing and uh, I think set a nice overview. That will be followed by Sam, um, who I know very well from work he's done with ourselves on a discussion group on uh, some very diverse lays. Um, and then Lindsay's going to finish it up with something that is, to me, completely left field. Um, so I'm looking forward to that paper and the discussion that then follows. Um, I, that's where we're going. Ian, I think, probably known to most people here, Ian Wilkinson, owner, managing director of Cotswold Seeds, uh, long-term supporter for the organic sector. Um, I'm going to say relatively recently acquired um, one of the more difficult farms on the Cotswolds um, and is turning it into a, a very useful resource um, looking at you know, home produced forages and uh, squaring that circle. So, yeah. Thanks William. Morning everyone. Um, I, yeah, I do normally wear another hat as you may know. Uh, but uh, I'm not wearing my seed hat today. I'm going to talk about the farm that we took on five years ago. We're on a bit of a journey with our farm, uh, and as William has explained, it's not the uh, easiest farm in the Cotswolds, um, but just to, to tell you a little bit about how we got there and why we're doing it. We, as you know, have always been very keen on using forage legumes in rotation, uh, forage herbs uh, with other grasses other than just rye grass. So we've been sort of developing those ideas over many years, and we thought what better way than to try and sort of show that through uh, a, farm, a real farming system. Um, you know, I was talking, talking to Chris Dean earlier on about you know, the need to have real examples of farming when you're trying to pass on information to other people. And this was for us, started off as a sort of, if you like, a shop front for what we do, were doing with the seeds and how the seeds were working. But we realised very quickly there was a need to go a little bit wider than that and to talk more about agriculture generally, agriculture and horticulture, and the need to integrate uh, many different things into the farming system. So this farm is only a small farm um, and we're on a long journey with it but we are developing it as an educational farm. That's the purpose of it. So when I talk about what we're doing with the farm, it's not specifically a commercial farm in the true sense. Unlike some of you here I know very well have got proper commercial farms. This is an educational farm so please see what I say in that light. So what I want to try and do this morning is to sort of set the scene as to what we're doing, why we're doing it, how important the forage is to the system and to the soil and to the sustainability of the farm. When we took the farm on, it was an ar largely an arable farm. There was a bit of permanent grass, which I'll talk about in a minute, but fundamentally when we went there, it was a typical light land Cotswold farm with lots of barley, uh, making very little money, and we decided we would change the whole system. We kept a, an area of control so that we could demonstrate what happens if you continue with a conventional system. So we have uh, two two-acre plots on this farm which we manage conventionally with fertilizers and herbicides. We cost everything and we're beginning to get a bit of a picture of what's happening. When we went to the farm, we weren't making any money on the barley, nor was the previous farmer, largely because the soil is very poor. This is proper, you know, top of the hill, oolitic limestone, Cotswold brash. There's a little bit of topsoil, not very much, about that much, and the rest of it is stone. And in fact, we are digging at the moment because we're building buildings on the farm. And we've dug down a long way because we have to get some firm soil. And these rocks uh, here, which you know, are sort of like fist size rocks, they just get bigger and bigger the further down you go. It's, it's a really interesting soil profile. So no wonder this continuous cereal crop that was being grown on this farm for years and years before we came was not viable because there's no inherent fertility. There was no livestock on the farm formerly. And so naturally it became infertile and, and impoverished. 
as we know that story very well, don't we, all of us? You know. So our mission was to try and do something different that would regenerate the farm, and to do that with crops and livestock, uh, not one or the other in preference, but both together. But I'm 55, and although I'm surrounded by my younger colleagues, um, we're all quite busy with, with uh, seeds and other things, and we decided the best way to introduce livestock onto the farm was to work with our neighbours. So our next door neighbour, uh, neighbour's son, uh, Ed, has a sheep flock and he's expanding his numbers. He's got a lot of sheep in the district, and so we use his sheep to come onto our farm. And it works ever so well because whilst we move them every day, we water them, we tend to them, he does the shearing, and he ultimately manages that flock. He likes them coming to our farm because they're very healthy, they're on a lot of herbal loads, so for him it's a zero input, here are the sheep, they come back very well. So it's a really nice arrangement. So we've got sheep on the farm for 10 months of the year. Uh, the reason the sheep are there, as I've stressed already, and I'll stress again, keep stressing it, they are there for the fertility. That's why they're there. They are work, but, you know, they're a lot of work. If you haven't got sheep on a farm and you're an arable farmer, this is more work you know, than, than a lot of people have been used to. Uh, I can tell you, particularly when you start to graze them tightly and move them daily, as we do. So we, in the spring, look for our earliest growth. And actually, on this farm, because we're about 400 feet up, there's not a lot of spring growth. Even with early growing grasses, coxfoot, tall fescue, there's not that much growth in February. So, and by February, of course, you know, as you will appreciate, from now on, we've got four months where we've got to feed animals. Two of, two of those months, they're not there, but for the, because there isn't enough on the farm. But for the rest of the time, they are. So in February, this is the first thing that grows. And this is yellow trefoil and white clover. So we've introduced this into part of our arable rotation to under-sow uh, to our previous cereal crop to provide an early bite in the spring. It's also really nice because this also gives us uh, cover on the soil. So it's poor soil, we will not lose a lot of it if we don't look after it. So to have a nice cover, which we can then graze first thing in the spring is really useful. So the sheep come in and they graze it pretty much down to nothing because when this has been grazed, we will then plough that in as a sp for a spring sown cereal. So it's sort of acting as a green bridge, it's acting as a forage, it's acting as an early forage, which is really, really important. Yellow trefoil and white clover we sow together because it gives us 100% ground cover, quite literally. When they graze it, you can see the, the drill rows where we put it in, and this is going in the same day as the spring cereal. So this gives us 100% ground cover, and we will graze that literally down to nothing because there's nothing else yet growing on this farm. So this is a lifeline for us. When it comes to March, we've got other things in our small rotation, our demonstration rotation, which is an eight-year rotation, by the way, which are in interspersed with our cereal crops. So this is a Westerwold vetch mix, which is just beginning to grow in March. If we're really desperate, we put them on quite early, like this. If we can leave it a little bit longer and we have a warm spring, we would have a lot more Westerwold. And it's a, such a critical line between having enough and not having enough, but having to go onto it because there's nothing else available yet. Cold farm, and as you know, the last two years, certainly in this part of England, have been jolly cold. So we've had no spring growth early. It's been cold until May, and we're high up, and it's poor ground. So no wonder we, you know, we're in a little bit early here. We tend to strip graze it. We're strip grazing about half an acre at a time. With, um, I think there was on this case, I think it was 80 ewes. These are two year olds. Um, but it's again really useful because the lays haven't quite got going. Give it another month suddenly the farm comes to life, as you know from your own experiences. Get into April, everything starts to grow like mad. So this here behind um, the fence where the sheep are is a herbal lay, which is what we're gonna talk a lot about today, I think, in amongst things here. Um, but in April, the herbal lays grow really, really well. And there is luxuriant growth on pretty much most of the species. Some of them do come later, which Sam's gonna talk about, I know, in a minute, so I'm not gonna cover that. But uh, you can see in the spring, there's this lovely, lovely lush growth. So we're not short of forage then. What we're short of perhaps is fences, uh, because you know keeping animals mob grazed, which is what we do, a bit controversial perhaps, but that's what we do. It's not for everybody, but for us as a demonstration farm, it works really well. We do have problems. One of them is fencing, because infrastructure is a real issue, but we've overcome that by using temporary electric fencing. We have hundreds of yellow posts and a good number of metal posts that we put in all the corners before we start and then we just move the wires. Some of the wires stay up permanently and we intersect you know, with making little pens. And roughly speaking, we move, um, we move our, we were moving two different groups this year, but we were moving, a, a, I think it was a quarter of an acre per day on average, and we were moving them every 50 days. So they're really tight, which is not good if you've got a lot of sunshine, 
there's no shade. But it's great for the forage because you can graze that forage down and it will recover very quickly because we're moving them on fast and we're leaving a lot of residual material behind as well. And I know those of you that have done this or researched this will know this already, but it's absolutely critical. And I'll show you an example where it doesn't work. Water is always an issue, of course, with these things. We, we have some permanent supply on the round the farm, but we don't have enough, so we use a Bowser. This IDC lasts sheep, it seems, forever. Sheep don't drink much water, in our experience, unless it's really hot. Cows are very different. They drink, as you know, loads, especially if they're milking. But the mobile water system for us has worked very well. Lots of people have lots of different ideas on this. But for us to have this mob grazing system to build soil fertility, we need to move the sheep regularly. We don't think it's right to, in our case, to set stop them because it just won't make the plants work. We won't get the excessive growth that we can get by mob grazing. Um, so we try and overcome the, the, um, the, the constraints by having you know, a nice portable system. It works really well. And when you're getting into May, well, it's just so easy. There's so much grass, you just you, know, you, you can't stop it growing. And I, in fact, in June on our farm, you sort of lose the sheep. There, it's getting that high open. And you've also got issues around the fence, you know, naturally yeah. the grass is growing up. So we, we, because of the sheep, if they've got lambs with them, we, we cut the grass underneath them, which is a real pain, but it's necessary, because otherwise the lambs are out, um, because it's shorting out. So we cut that with an Allen side. We are a demonstration farm. I know this isn't what a lot of you would do on a bigger scale, but it, for us, works. Come June, we're sort of getting through our herbal lays quite fast. And if there's lambs involved, they're getting bigger, and they're eating a lot more. So we tend then to think, well, we need a big gap in rotation here to get the regrowth. When you go back to lays and you're grazing them really tight very quickly, you don't get so much regrowth, as you know, simply because the light of from the, the can't get into the leaves if they're not there. So we believe with the herbal lays particularly, these complex mixtures of species, it's better to have a lot of growth to get further synthesis. So we move the sheep very often off the lays in the middle of the summer to permanent grass, which we have about 40 acres of, which is really useful. Um, this is, we, we set stock in some cases, not in all. In this particular case, we had an experiment running, which one or two of you, I think, know about, where we, we had two flocks of sheep, uh, one on permanent grass and one on herbal lays, and we were monitoring for intestinal worms to see what difference it would make with a herbal lay versus permanent pasture where sheep had been previously. Uh, the results aren't yet published, I'm afraid, so it's a master's student doing the work, and she hasn't uh, made the results public yet. But it's really interesting to try and sort of see what differences you will get if you manage flocks differently uh, in the same year. So it's an interesting experiment for us. But again, mob grazing. Now this is an orchard. This is 15 acres of permanent grass with orchards. And the trees are spread at 10 meters. I don't know how whether this is interesting to our last speaker, uh, Lindsay, but I, I just put it in just to show you that you know, even <coughs> people that haven't got trees on their farm are considering this idea, partly for shade, we don't want them to eat the trees there. It's actually really difficult because the, the sheep will climb these and we have two wooden posts with a plastic wrap. I hate plastic, personally, like we all do these days. But um, it's a necessary evil on this farm to keep the deer off and I thought it would keep the sheep out. Unfortunately, the sheep are climbing these, which is really annoying, so we've, we've had to fence on the inside of them. It's really tricky to fence that. It's almost impossible. It drove us mad. But we were midway through the experiment and we decided we would carry on uh, to deliver the result. Um, Come July, you know, again later in July, we're back into the herbal lays. But look, do you see how that's just been a little, I, in my opinion, that's been a little bit overgrazed. That's nothing like the lays were in June, is it? It's, we're going back into these lays when they're only so high. We should be up here somewhere to get huge amounts of material. So, different years are different. There's some years you have more grass than others, of course. Last year was a short year. But I'd much rather see them going into these sort of crops where there's a lot more material. And this was this August on very dry ground in Cotswolds, and we were really pleased with that. You know, for us, that was a result. It's not as thick as we would normally have had in August, but there's forage there. On all the farms around us, of course, there was nothing left. There was no regrowth because we hadn't had rain since you know, months earlier. So that was a really interesting experience for us. Come September, we've got new lays, and even this last year, we had new lays uh, growing at the end of September um, from a May sowing. And we have, and these are herbal lays, it's amazing. If you get the rain when they're sown, they're very resilient indeed. So failures, we didn't have a failure. I know lots of people did have failures on different farms, with different mixtures, um, and we had some herbal mixtures fail. But if you're fortunate and you have a, pr a series of things going on on the farm, so some reseeds, some old lays, some one-year lays, some permanent pasture, 
some yellow trefoil, some westerwolds. That was the key to our success this year when it was dry. So the resilient system for us came from having all these different forages. Yeah, it was really quite, quite interesting. Um, in October, we graze, uh, well now in fact, uh, we graze our sandfoin. So this is regrowth on sandfoin. Our sand, we have 15 acres of sandfoin which we cut for hay. It was the most, uh, the biggest crop we, ha we, we have on the farm is the sandfoin. We take, I think it's 150 bales, small bales, an acre off our sandfoin for one cut. And then we graze it in the autumn and sometimes we say take a seed crop as well. But this is now the sheep going in uh, to regrowth. And that's really nice at the end of the season because of course the grasses have stopped. We don't want to be destroying our herbal lays or our temporary lays. The sand point for one graze for a week or two is fine. And then we also uh, have, in, as part of our rotation, stubble turnips and forage rape. Now this is a very poor crop. Often you get poor crops on the farm uh, on our stony brash, as a lot of farms do. But my point is, it's the winter. It's half a crop. It's better than no crop. And it's very important to have you know, these overlapping things. They may not be perfect. But if you've got a gap in the rotation, and in this case we would have had stubble, you know, or a lay that had been ploughed in, well, why not fill that gap with half a crop? These are very cheap seeds, uh, very easy to, to establish. Organically, there are issues around flea beetle, but on a mixed farm, I don't know, we, they're there, and if you get the weather wrong, i.e. it's too dry, then it's a problem. But if the fertility's in the rotation, and this is after a grass lay, well, you can see the result. You know, some of the bulbs were okay. I mean, it wasn't a great crop, but it was enough to keep them going for a few weeks. What we don't want is to get into this situation where we're grazing next to nothing and having to feed a lot of hay. Uh, we sell hay off the farm, actually. Uh, it's the only thing we sell off the farm, but that's where it goes uh, because it's a very high-value cash crop in our particular case. Um, and we don't really want to be in this position. So what we do is pick up the phone and say, Ed... The sheep have eaten everything, will you please take them back? And then they go somewhere else. So Ed's got new lays, other people have got permanent pasture. And you might say, well, that's a cop-out. But that's what we've done for five years. And it works really well. And finally, if I could just have a very small plug for our new education centre. We are. This is last week. We are building our new education centre at the farm. Uh, there's a, a number of buildings going up. This is the first one, and we're hoping that by the middle of the summer we will have an education facility on a farm that we will want, we want to share with any, anybody that's interested in sustainable <coughs> regen ag. So um, there we are. So that's my.